Thank you so much, Fumio, and it's a pleasure to be here, especially on the 10th anniversary of the Mori Art Museum, to think a little bit about the way in which museums animate, activate, and make uh, viable our cities. And Fumio asked me to speak a little bit about uh, the way in which the Museum of Modern Art over the last decade has expanded. And I took that to mean not just within the city, but as an institution and as an idea around the world. But let me begin by simply, oops, by simply locating the museum, because the Museum of Modern Art is fundamentally an urban institution. It's located just to the south of Central Park, and in one of the most dense environments in the world, in the center of midtown Manhattan, and it literally is nestled into the street, uh, surrounded by skyscrapers and other buildings. And it is this aspect of the museum, its kind of urban uh, centrality, that gave rise to the institution as a very particular kind of place. Because if you think about most museums, especially uh, in the 1920s when the Museum of Modern Art was founded, at least in North America, they were often located in the middle of a park or a garden. They were set apart from the city up a flight of stairs. If you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you'll know what I mean. The founders of the Museum of Modern Art, however, thought of it as a place that was grounded on the street, that drew its energy, its livelihood, and its meaning from its relationship to the city as an urban space. And this idea of the museum rooted in the street, rooted in the city, is precisely what Yoshio Taniguchi uh, who took as his point of departure a decade ago when he redesigned the museum and expanded it, because his notion was to take that street and extend it within the institution to make the institution, if you wish, a mirror of its urban environment. And this is reflected not only in the way in which people circulate and navigate within the institution, but also in the idea that at the heart of the museum was a central atrium or gathering place that could, in its own way, mirror Central Park as a place that you went to to take a moment to breathe in the middle of the urban environment, to take a moment to reflect, to be with friends, and to relax, so that he saw the museum as not only a place of energy, but also a place of gathering, and ultimately as a place of repose. And here, the garden in the museum becomes the moment where you can suddenly slow down. And I think that is an essential aspect of what museums can do within cities. They can provide an awful lot of energy, but they can also provide a space in which to think, reflect, and decelerate. As we've tried to understand our role in the city, we've also recognized that we're a private institution, and one of our realities is we have to charge admission, uh, which is not something that makes it easy for us to engage the largest pop possible audience. So what we have done recently is to turn our garden into a free space where anyone from the city of New York can just simply come before we're open, relax, enjoy a moment with sculpture, and in this way, let's the museum seep out from inside its own space. Now, the Museum of Modern Art is many different places. It is an institution on 53rd Street in Midtown Manhattan. It is also MoMA PS1, a center for contemporary art, on the opposite side of the East River, about two and a half miles from Midtown Manhattan. And this is very important because MoMA PS1 is a very different place. It allows a very different audience to engage with the museum. If Manhattan is this dense urban environment, Long Island City and Queens are much more spread out, and demographics are fundamentally different. Where the Museum of Modern Art has a huge international audience, MoMA PS1 has a more local audience. Where the Museum of Modern Art's audience tends to be 40 or 50 years old, MoMA PS1's audience tends to be 25 years old and is rooted in the outer boroughs, Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island. And this allows the museum to play a dual role within the city, engaging not one borough but two boroughs in a kind of dynamic. And I always admire the way you look back on Manhattan 
for a moment, PS1, recognizing that New York is a much more complicated place than a single borough. Now, one of the things that we're able to do out in uh, Long Island City is to actually build architecture, because one of our responsibilities is architecture, along with painting and sculpture and photography and film and media. And so every summer we build a temporary structure that becomes a site of a music festival. And that music festival allows us to bring literally thousands of young people together to experience new music, architecture, and the city in a different way. And what we realized is this provided an opportunity for us to think about the museum not only uh, as a place where you look at art in a traditional sense, but also as a place where you can think about art in very different ways. And this led us to start imagining the museum as a partner with other institutions around the world. And we've taken the Young Architects program call it uh, YAP for short, and extended that now to Rome with the Museum of the 21st Century. And every year we run a joint competition with the Museum for the 21st Century, as well as Santiago, Chile, where we work with Constructo, and most recently in Istanbul with the Istanbul Modern. So now the idea of the Museum of Modern Art and its programs has to be seen as part of multiple cities. And I think this is very important because there's a tendency when we think of the city to think of it as a single location in a particular latitude and longitudinal axis. But in the global world, cities are all interconnected to each other through digital media, as well as more physical means. And through these partnerships, what we're really doing is knitting together a number of different urban centers in a shared conversation and dialogue. Something that we also are doing with shared programs that we are developing on bilateral bases with institutions like the Art Gallery of Western Australia and many others where we can share our collections and expertise and where we can learn from other institutions about their knowledge and thus continuing to build the idea of the museum as an aggregator of information, possibilities, and ideas. If you extend that now through a whole range of educational initiatives, like massive online courses or MOOCs, uh, what we've learned is that the museum can become a hub for a whole set of activities that can reach a much different and much broader audience than we ever imagined. We launched our first MOOC uh, this summer, and it was a online course for teachers, and we had 17,000 participants that stayed throughout the entire course, uh, from 66% of which were from outside the United States. And much more importantly, you begin to see on a map like this that we touch over 100 countries. So a single place can radiate out and connect literally dozens in multiple dozens of places to each other. And what fascinates me is not the idea of a center with spokes, but rather a kind of open network that is constantly reconstituting itself each time a new institution or a new place joins and reconfigures all of the pre-existing relationships. Now, if the museum is a physical place in Manhattan and a physical place in Long Island City and a series of programs that radiate around the world. It is also a digital space uh, and it exists online and I think most museums have learned that their online audience is as important as their physical audience. But what's interesting about an online audience is its growth is, inf is exponential and infinite whereas physical audiences are limited by space. And more importantly, I think we've all evolved to realizing that what we do online does not have to be identical to what we do in space. And thus, we can take the idea of the museum and continue to expand it and engage it. And in this context, we launched recently something called Audio Plus, which is a way of imagining the museum in your hand. It's not simply an audio guide that lets you learn about the museum. It's also a handheld social networking device that lets you connect to everybody else in the museum who's on this device at the same time and to share ideas, to start conversations, to organize, to meet in an individual space, to even take photographs and share them with each other. In, in the first five weeks of 
launching this, 500,000 photographs have been shared among users here. And what that tells me is that there is a community that is hungry to connect to each other within the city about art. And that community can begin the conversation within the museum, but it can also extend it outside the museum into an ongoing loop. And if you just look at the impact of social media in the context of the museum, you can immediately see the numbers of people who are using social networks to talk to each other about experiences in the museum. And this is an integral part of the city as well, because the city has to understand itself both as a physical and metaphorical place. And that's what's taking place in these conversations online. When you add it all together, a place that if it were limited only to those who walked in the door might draw three million people a year, actually has a worldwide audience of some 41 million people a year. That is, if you add in all the people who come on site, who see our programs off site, who connect online through social media, and who share our educational initiatives, you begin to understand that the scope of our institution, like the scope of many other institutions, is larger than the entire population of the city of New York. This radiation, if you want to look at it that way, of the impact of what we do, I think highlights how powerful museums are within the social fabric of their cities. There are very few other kinds of institutions that can touch this many people so consistently and bind them together in a shared conversation about art. Now, if this has been about the way the museum has connected outward, I want to also talk for a moment about how the museum has endeavored to change its relationship to the city. Uh, we began a whole series of experiments to take the museum in a way outside its own walls, to make it woven into the way in which people experience New York. This is a project called Sleepwalkers by Doug Aiken that we did several years ago, where Doug turned the entire exterior of the museum into a cinematic multiplex that told a kind of story about five different New Yorkers who and their imagined existence. But what it really did was to provide anyone who was wandering down the streets at night the opportunity to see something new and different and to stop for a moment and to think about their city and how it operated. In a similar vein, this summer we presented Rain Room, which we took over an empty lot near the museum and did this project with Random International, a Berlin-based group, that imagined what it would be like to be in the middle of a thunderstorm with the rain pouring down on you and you being the only person who remained dry. Uh, and this was a little bit of magic. It was the idea, and it was a project that uh, started in London, uh, and no doubt will travel elsewhere in the world, but it drew literally hundreds of thousands of people to think about an experience in their city that would have been impossible to present inside the museum, A, because of the amount of space required, but B, because of the amount of water that was circulating and that would have been an extraordinarily difficult challenge. So we were able to take a project and weave it into the fabric of the city, and by doing that, allow New Yorkers to think about their city in a different way. Or more specifically, to engage our public in the very act of being a citizen within the institution. And this is a project by Roman Undock called Measuring Your Universe, in which anyone who walked into a room could have their height inscribed on a wall and their initials. And so you begin this project by one or two people coming into a room and then each being noted uh, for uh, the day and the height, they, the day they came in their height. And eventually you begin to have a wall that marks all of the various people who came into the museum until ultimately you have this extraordinary kind of vortex reflecting each person. But what's important about this project is that it allows a, a group of people who would otherwise be anonymous to be inscribed into the institution as individuals. And by doing that, it lets people who use the museum take ownership of the museum. Now they're as much a part of the institution as any work of art on the wall. And this ability of the institution in a way to grab hold of a public 
and frame it and embed it into the museum is a way of taking the, the kind of large anonymity of what it's like to walk through the city on a street where you go by hundreds of people and suddenly have each one of those memorialized within the institution. And I want to conclude by suggesting that what museums can do better than almost any institution I know for a city is be a home for the multitude, a place where literally tens of thousands of people a day can find something interesting, can connect to each other and to art, can feel a part of the fabric of the city, but at the same time be a place where a single person can find a unique experience and literally jump for joy. And when museums can fulfill these two different roles between the large and the small, the individual and the mass, the particular and the general, then they become like catalytic engines that can drive the cultural and intellectual life of the city. And I always like this image that Yoshio created for us of the museum, where it is exploding out of its walls, where its energy becomes the energy of the street, and where the street itself becomes the energy of the museum. It's in this way that a place like the Museum of Modern Art is an inherently urban institution and part of the larger intellectual life of the city. Thank you very much.